to feel feel us, to be with us, to commune with us, to abide with us and in us, to dwell with us. Lord, I just ask that you just go forth. I ask that you hide me behind your cross. I ask that the words and the voice that they hear is your, your words and your voice. I ask that your anointing go out before me. I ask that it already is in the individual rooms where your people are at for this body of Christ, Lord. I ask that it touch and that it moves. And again, Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I wanted to come to you tonight and I want to talk to you about the Lord of righteousness, the Lord of righteousness. In the book of John, matter of fact, John 1 and 18, he reads as follows. No man has seen God at any time the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father. He has declared him. We have to remember Moses. We all remember Moses, but not even Moses has seen God. Moses seen the backside, his goodness, but not his glorious face, not his eyes, not his nose or his lips. Moses heard his voice and not the small, still voice. Abraham, Noah, David, Solomon, the prophet Isaiah proclaims, the prophet Isaiah proclaims that the Lord is high and lifted up and his train of his robe fills the temple. Now, the length of a king's robe means the strength the security, the glory, the splendor, the triumph, and the victory that he possesses. Even the prophet Ezekiel, for as much as he's seen, and much as that the Lord has revealed to him, has not seen the Lord. His visions of God, and he describes the Lord like this. And above the ferment that was over the heads was like the likeness of a throne, as appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man of, upon it. And as I saw in the, the in, in, and as I saw as the color of ember, as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of this of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about it as the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain He's describing a rainbow. So was the appearance of the brightness around him. This was the appearance in the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. Now, since God is Lord over all things and King and king above all kings. He is the Lord of righteousness. Now, if we was to look up the word Lord in Hebrew, it would, it would say is a don. The word is a don in Hebrew, the Lord, which can refer to kings, masters of servants, or shepherds. In the, in, in the Bible, the authors use a don to refer to God such as the Lord of all earth or the Lord of lords. Adon is written in lowercase letters in the King J version of the Bible. 
The Hebrew word Yahweh is self-revealed name of the God of the Old Testament and translates to Lord. And in the English Bible, Yahweh comes from the Hebrew verb to be and mean that the God is eternal and self-existent. So what I'm trying to do now is just really just break down just the title really because the title really explains the whole message of what it is. The Lord of Righteousness. He is the Lord of Righteousness. In the Bible, Lord can, can also refer to the God, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, Christ. For example, in Matthew eleven twenty-five, 25, Lord means that Jesus is the one who's given God's rule over creation. And the Father is also Lord and the Master and ruler of heaven and earth. Lords over all things means that everything in life has a central purpose and reason for being. And the one should, the one should, and one should honor God and put his principles above everything else. It also means that God is the Lord over creation. He lords over creation and exercises his rule through his authority as king control over all things and presence with his people and his presence with his people throughout his creation. Now, before I continue, I would like to speak about unrighteousness and self-righteousness because I believe that you can't just speak about righteousness and not also speak about unrighteousness and self-righteousness. By definition, unrighteousness means injustice and violation of a divine law or of the of the plain principle of justice and equal wickedness. Unrighteousness may consist of a single unjust act, but more generally than applied to persons. It denotes the habitual course of wickedness. In Psalm 51, 4 and 5, the ESV version, the easy standard version reads, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We all have heard this. I was born in sin and shaped, it shaped in iniquity. This is pretty much explaining humanity. So I have an open question for everyone. You can either type it in or you could uh, open your mic and speak as you, as you feel free. What is iniquity, in, iniquity to you? Does, does anyone have the meaning or the understanding of just, you know, just off the, whatever comes to your mind, iniquity? What is iniquity? Um, immoral behavior. Can you repeat that again? Immoral behavior. Immoral behavior. Thank you. Anyone else? No cheating. No, no Googling it. <laughs> just off the top of your head, there's no, there's no wrong or right answers. I just want to kind of get a, 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 a audience participation in it. That's all. Like sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I was gonna say un uh wrongful uh doing that is not godly, ungodly uh wrongful doing. I don't know how to really to uh put it, but 
Elder Stubblefield said what I was going to say. Amen. Amen. Iniquity leads to rebellion. It's no fear of God. It's unnatural affection and a deprived and a depraved mind. Romans 1, 28 and 30 through 32. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. And 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion against godly authority is the iniquity that angers God. Now, I know that all of us came to Christ, but all of us at one point in time was in iniquity. Like the scripture says, we were born, we were born and we were born in sin, we were shaped in iniquity. Because there was only one who was born outside of that, created outside of that. And we all have walked in unrighteousness and self-righteousness. Because if not, we would not be sitting here today. We wouldn't be praising the Lord. We would not even have gave, given our life to Christ. We wouldn't have the testimony that we have of how the goodness of God has, has prevailed in our lives, has met us day to day, challenge and challenge, moment after moment. We wouldn't have that story. You would have a story of, I know not of God, or I am not with God, or I am not saved, or I do not know God or I do or I do not possess the Holy Spirit you wouldn't have a joyous response of the Holy Spirit you would know nothing you would have nothing you would have nothing like that uh no I don't I don't have a, a, a window open or anything yeah, I think Deacon, what they're referring to, there's um there's a lot of noise coming through. Oh, is uh, there? Yeah, as if it were like some sort of motorized something. Yeah. We, yeah. I think that's my computer. Is, is it faded right there? Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the computer. I'm sorry. That's okay. Amen. Okay, now also with also with iniquity. Now just like now just like everyone else, there was there was unrighteous, there was unrighteousness, there was there was unrighteous people in the Bible. For the most part, yes, the Bible is about Christ. But the people in the body was mostly about unrighteous people and self-righteous people. So we know the story of Saul. Saul of Tarsus was one of the most evilest men noted in the Bible to walk against the Lord. He, pers he, he persuaded, he persecuted followers. He incited hate to have the followers of Jesus Christ murdered, thrown in pits with hungry lions. He destroyed homes and lives with his rebellious acts against Christ and his followers. As the, and he, even Apostle Paul himself proclaimed, I was the chief of sinners. Others unrighteous and self-righteous people in the Bible was Zacchaeus, the greedy tax collector. Miriam, she gossiped and she had envy. The women at the well, she was caught in sexual sin and she was a Samaritan. Jonah was disobedient. The prodigal son was wasteful and rebellious. The Philippian jailer was cruel. Cornelius was a Gentile and an adulterer. Moses was a murderer and fugitive. Samson was a Philistine and a Nazarite and he was also disobedient. And David, yes, we, mem we remember David was a, an adulterer and a murderer. But we read and we, and, we, and we study about all of these. 
you know, as I was as I was writing this message out, and a thought came to me. We are no different from these people, these people that we study, that we read, that we teach about in this Bible than today. Just our time life, our timeline of life is different. We are positioned for the moment of eternity. Do you see the thoughtfulness and the accuracy of how God breathed you out? What am I saying? If we was to be born during the time of, that, the, that the Bible was being enacted, Maybe we would have been there. Maybe we'd have been there during the, the time of Jesus. Maybe would have we would have been there during after Jesus. But in reality, we are no different from those that are in the Bible. Now, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is the greatest example. With the, the greatest example of self-righteousness in the Bible is not even connected to a person. So I have another question. Can someone tell me the greatest act in the Bible of self-righteousness? I'll even give you a hint. One was a parable. There's, there's actually two. One was a parable. And one was set before the foundations of the world. No, it wasn't Adam and Eve. Can you repeat the question? What is the what is the greatest example or demonstration of self-righteousness in the Bible? And it's not connected to a person. The snake in the garden. You're close. Satan himself. <laughs> You're close. <laughs> It was it was it was the act of Lucifer. It was an act of Satan, and how he went forth from being the greatest angel of God's army and being thrown out of heaven for a mutiny against God. And then there's the parable of the Pharisees and the publican, or the Pharisee and the tax collector, appears to be in the Gospel of Luke, eighteen, nine, and fourteen, a self righteous Pharisee. A set of obsessed with his own virtue, in contrast with the publican who was humbly asking for God for, for mercy. Now, I believe that there is demonic systems set up in the world we live in to arouse, seduce, entice our hearts and our minds and our spirits to believing that what this flesh does is right before our almighty father. There is a lot of things that go on in some churches. I'm gonna repeat that there in some churches that are not biblically or spiritually come close to being godly in the presence of a, of a holy almighty creator. There is a scripture that reads do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he will also reap. That is Galatians 6 and 7. Now the Lord of righteousness, Jehovah Sikhanu, is the Lord of righteousness. Jehovah means God, supreme being, most high God, Jehovah Sikhanu. We may know Jehovah is the name of God, which is translated as Lord. Sikhanu, which means our righteousness altogether. Jehovah Sikhanu, the Lord, our righteousness. Everything about God's nature and acts are righteous 
or upright. His nature and acts include his justice, his faithfulness, and his and his covenants, his saving grace, his mercy, his love, his redemption of believers, his reconciliation of believers to himself, his judgment, his supreme rule, and so on. So each of these are expressions of his righteousness. God is a spirit, so righteousness is produced or flows out of him. Holy righteousness is only found within him. His purity of, of righteousness is contained in his Holy Spirit. The Bible has, has described God as being of a bright light or father of light. Now I want you to see this. The Bible describes God as being a bright light or father of lights, the brightness of his coming, the brightness of his presence, the brightness of his being. Now I'm gonna go back to Moses. Moses wasn't allowed to see God's fullness, only his backside. And even when Moses seen that, he had to wear a veil to try to cover his face from the, from the great I am, revealing his righteous glory. Remember Saul? Saul was knocked off his horse by a bright light and heard a voice which no one else seen or heard. His horse didn't even react to it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That the preciseness and the accuracy of God, how God works, to so if he if whoever he wants, he can reveal himself. And no one else would even know that his presence or his being is even there. But yet, he is the father of light. <clears throat> and, he, and, his, and his brightness of his glory is blinding. Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 reads like this. But then in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who he appointed and the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the un universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Matthew stated in his relationship with Jesus that he should seek his righteousness, that he should seek God's righteousness. He should seek Jesus's righteousness before all other things. Faith is a key principle to our righteousness with a holy God. Our Father has no problem giving us the desires of our hearts or the desires of your hearts. He delights in giving us gifts, but it is done in righteousness and in his timing. So walk as Abraham did upright. Walk as Job did upright. Walk as Noah did upright. Walk as Stephen did upright. And before I leave you, I want to leave you with these two scriptures. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver, and gold, but will the precious blood of Jesus, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Second Corinthians 5 and 21. For our sake, we made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So as so at, us as being the redeemed of the righteous one, 
we have we have been translated from unrighteous and self-righteous to being righteous when we came into agreement when we gave our life to christ we are we are walking in righteousness so as i said before walk up right before god walk up walk up in righteousness live in righteousness worship in righteousness speak in righteousness because we serve the lord of righteousness and that is what i have for to you that's what i have for you today thank you amen deacon praise the lord we thank god for the message that you gave us tonight uh, let's pray for you hallelujah father in the name of jesus we thank god for you lord bringing us today this message lord we thank god we thank you god for deacon colston we thank you lord for using him and giving us this breakdown of these terms lord father we ask that you put a hedge of protection around him that he may be refreshed he may not be bothered spiritually he may just have peace in his spirit in his mind in his house tonight lord we thank you and we praise you refresh him lord replenish him in jesus name we pray amen amen praise the lord deacon uh that was um that was a, a, a very academic study tonight of the word amen and we thank God for using you in that manner. And um, I got to get the first scripture. You said John 1 and 18, I believe. Um, so that's where you started. At least that's what I got. Hold on, and then I'll give my commentary. Um, I just need to paste that in here. So, okay, got it. Yeah, that was um, it. John 1 and 18. Yeah. Yeah, so the title of this message tonight, The Lord Our Righteousness. Oh, and, the Lord of Righteousness. The Lord of Righteousness. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, I think there is a name, Jehovah, something that's the Lord Our Righteousness. Um, so sorry about that, getting that mixed up. Um, but I thank God for using you tonight. And let me um, get this. Hallelujah. Yeah, Jehovah sicken you uh, means the Lord our righteousness. So thank you. Amen. Um, and I thought that's what you said. Amen. <laughs> but praise the Lord. Uh, I think you did mention that earlier, later on in your lesson, you did mention Jehovah sicken you. Amen. But we're talking about righteousness. And it was amazing that you broke this down because... Um, you know, you talked about, first of all, a king's role, and you went on to describe the essence of God. And within the essence of God, you know, we, we come to the realization that there really is nothing like him, um, nothing at all. And in terms of his, um, his presence, um, his power, his, um, his spirit, his anointing is uh, surpasses all human understanding. And the scripture you gave us, uh, John 1 and 18 said that, that no man have seen God at any time. Um, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, hath declared him. Uh, amen. So we thank God for that because we know that there are people that claim that they've seen God, but we, we know that they have not seen God. And so you broke down two different words in which you posed the question to the ministry about unrighteousness and self-righteousness. And you went through the definitions, unrighteousness consisting of an act or um, something that someone does that can be considered wicked. It can be considered as um, iniquity, which which we also defined as sin, immoral behavior, and doing things wrong. And so we have this element of human existence that we 
come into this, this place of unrighteousness before the Lord. And then you also said that there was an act of, of self-righteousness. And then you went through a list of people that could be called unrighteous or self-righteous in the Bible. And you mentioned two particular instances in scripture where there was an egregious uh, violation of, of, of God through, uh, through the act of Lucifer turning against God in heaven when Lucifer was the angel. Mm -hmm. And then you came back and said the Pharisees and the publicans. Now, I got stuck on the Lucifer turning against God in heaven. And I got to tell you that the situation there, uh, you know, when you think about it, why would an angel that's in heaven all of a sudden turn against God? I mean, he could not have had it better than what he did um, in heaven. and But yet and still, um, the beauty and his pride and all those other things rose up. And he thought that he could do something um, on the same level of God, even to the point to where he wanted to fight God, mm -hmm. um, which was um, preposterous in any stretch of the imagination. And so you mentioned that that was like the ultimate act of self-righteousness, um, and it happened in heaven. So it didn't even happen in the earth realm. It happened in the heavenly realm, but the earth realm was completely impacted by it. Praise the Lord. And so I began to think about that just while you were ministering, that the effects of that is still uh, prevalent today, uh, where we have, um, you know, scenarios where people take it upon themselves and they decide that they're going to be a certain way at a certain time um, at their choosing, praise the Lord. And that could mean that um, in those moments, they they might decide that, they um, don't want to adhere to uh, the voice of God, the essence of God, the power of God. So they do something that in their mind is right, but in the eyes of the Lord is not right. Praise the Lord. It's unrighteous or self-righteous, as you mentioned. And then you begin to describe Jehovah Tick and you. Uh, and this reminded me of something because um, Evangelist Doublefield used to study the the various names of God. So immediately it brought back to my memory, um, you know, Jehovah Sick and New, um, because that's one of the names that she would also call out. And so um, the Lord, our righteousness, um, amen. And so as you begin to break it down, you, you, you mentioned that even Moses, um, he had to be behind the cleft of a rock and then God still had to put his hand there and God still only showed him the backside. So can you imagine a cleft, which is only a few inches wide, and then mm -hmm. imagine uh, not only being behind the cleft of the rock, but then God putting his hand over it, right? So, so you got a cleft, you got God's hand, and then when God lifts his hand, the only thing that Moses can see is the backside of God, if if you can even imagine a backside mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> so, so, that, so that is another fascinating um, fact about this supernatural event that describes God in his uh, divinity and in his brightness. Amen. And so the Bible, as you mentioned, describes God um, as a bright light. And, and then you mentioned something I thought was very profound. You said God can reveal himself through anything he wants. And I thought that was also amazing because um, those that have a certain level of discernment and those that are seeking um, God and seeking signs and wonders and seeking uh, those things will see that God does reveal himself. God can reveal himself in a tree. Um, God can give you a revelation by looking at the clouds. God can give us a revelation of him in practically every area of life and even agriculture itself when it comes up out the ground it yeah. comes up it yeah. comes up upward to god everything that is born or that grows always grows up mm -hmm. yes now, sir even, even <laughs> though it might not stay up praise the lord but the initial act of growth in the earth realm is to go up in other words, in an act of 
praise and adoration to the most high God. Hallelujah. And so even the Bible says that the heaven even declares his glory. My God, the stars, amen. So you were breaking it down about all these things. And, and you also said that he is the father of lights. And so if we take all this into consideration, then, and we contrast that with the will of man, then you could see that there is no comparison, amen. There's no comparison between uh, our, our, our faults. And as you mentioned, our iniquities and, and our wickedness and our sin, uh, our nature, when it's compared to a holy God, my Lord, we need some help. <laughs> Amen. So that's what you said, sir, in, in, in so many words. And then Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, you mentioned that God who had sundry times and diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And then in the last day, he spoke to us by his son. Amen. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Um, and that's another scripture that that fascinates me, Deacon, because you got to think of, of how that phrase is actually worded. It says, by the word of his power. It did not say the power of his word. It said the word of his power. In other words, there is a derivative of the essence and the power and the strength of God that is only experienced through the word of God. Because he says, by the word of his power. So can yeah. you imagine that power in and of itself, if it exists, then it could, it could, it could, it could actually make itself a word. So the the power can become a word. In the beginning was God. And uh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise <laughs> the Lord. Hallelujah. In the beginning was the word with God. And the word was God. Praise the Lord. So in other words, we are seeing a direct manifestation of that scripture, the word of his power. Amen. So thank you, Deacon, for, for bringing that out. And then that second part of that, he had pur himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so you just broke it down tonight, sir, about all these things. I'm just uh, repeating in my own paraphrase of what and my understanding of how you delivered this message tonight. And we thank the Lord for using you in that way. Amen. So the righteousness of God, the Lord of righteousness. Amen. So church, let's give the Lord praise for using Deacon Colston tonight to deliver that word to us. Amen. Deacon, thank you so much, sir. Um, that was that was amazing. Praise the Lord. Like I said, that was kind of like an academic word. Amen. Because you have to kind of go into these scriptures and take out the nuances of uh, the revelation of these. Amen. And spiritually discern what was being said tonight. So we thank the Lord for using you, sir. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. At this time, church, I don't know if our pastor is still on. I uh, know I talked to him. He said he might have to get off early. But if pastor...